All right. Felicidades, everyone. Happy Friday, June 26. And we're so excited to have Colman Domingo here from, where are you from? Uh, where are you right now? I'm in LA right now. Oh, okay. On the hiatus, but all, but you're always working, you're, you're developing projects, you're doing yeah. the thing. Mm -hmm. I'm, and a yeah, lot of exactly. People, mm -hmm. and we were just talking about how a lot of folks don't know that you spent some time in the Bay Area. Oh, yeah. I've spent um, 10 years of my early, early career when Coleman was a baby in the Bay Area. I moved from Philadelphia, um, where I studied journalism at Temple University. I uh, left there with the 16 credits shy and moved to the Bay Area. I thought I'd be there just for a little bit, just hanging out with a bunch of, you know, my brothers who lived in a studio apartment not in, in the Mission. No, no, actually in the Tenderloin. Tenderloin. And so there was three guys living in the studio. I became the fourth. And... Um, the Bay Area just got into my soul and I just couldn't leave. And I just started to create from there. And I started, I started my entire career from there. Right. And speaking of soul, was, was, was that where you were developing or where you developed uh, a boy and a soul at the description? Or did that come later when you returned back to the East Coast? That came there. That, that started there. In uh, what, about 2004, I was, um, I was living in New York. Um, Let's see, I guess I feel like I'm jumping around a little bit. Let's see, I, my Bay, I was in the Bay Area from the 91 until 2001. Right. And then I moved to New York. And while I was still, you know, hustling, as, as we all do, and I had a bartending job at the 55 Bar in the West Village. And between the hours of 1 a.m. and 4 a.m., it, it was still open until 4 a.m. And it was, I would just have some friends come by, I would play some music, I would write, I would write by myself. And because it, as a working artist, I felt that, I don't know where this came from, but I just knew that like every opportunity was an opportunity to create. And so I was creating while I was at this bar and I created this piece about music and my relationship to music. And I was just playing this stuff as I was dealing with these themes that are in my solo show um, about cleaning out my parents' um, basement and being a uh, being an adult. I, th I think it was what, 36 when I created that. Mm -hmm. And I felt like uh, I felt like a, someone's knowing that I, I was an adult, but I felt like a kid. And I was actually having a, a sort of another coming of age as my parents were beginning to make their transition. So I, um, I was creating this piece. To be very honest, I feel like every piece that I write in some way, especially earlier in my career, I was writing to with questions that I had about how do we take care of each other? How, does, uh, how do we move through these moments? And so I created A, a Boy in the Soul. And um, I did, of course, my roots were in the Bay Area. So um, Tony Kelly, uh, I chose director of the description he, he was like so come on, what are you working on right now so i'm working on something i don't know what it is if it's a play if it's a i don't know if it's a solo whatever the said but he said well why don't we read it came to san francisco on my many trips back and we read it and he um he was like yeah it's you it's he said the story lives in you it is a solo now i'd never done a solo before and so mm -hmm. it was all an experiment to be honest because also i thought well i don't like solo shows i didn't think there were many show solo shows that i liked because i thought that they were very I don't know, I just thought they were very much like, look what I can do or showcase. I didn't understand why a solo had to be a solo until mm -hmm. I understood why the event had to be you, why it had to come from one source. And that was uh, working with Tony Kelly, to be honest. And then um, that developed into what it did. We did the first production at Thick Description. And um, I honestly, I knew that I had, I finally realized I had something to say, truly, mm -hmm. and as, a, as an artist. And then uh, we performed it in, then it went to the off Broadway at the Vineyard, and then um, but each each step of the way, I can I can even go into that. Like, how do we push forward our own work? Because not because I think when I give the broad strokes, it seems like oh, it went from, I think anyone tells a story they're like oh, it went from here, and then it was off Broadway, and then it went to London and Australia. But I'm like, no, there's a lot of uh, hustle that went in there, and it's a lot of uh, self uh, promotion, actualization, things you have to do to actually get your work produced. And I know that I was doing that. You know, so, right. um, you, know, you know. And that was the first time you had essentially self-produced a work of yours that you had. No, that was the second time. That was the most popular. The first time okay. was that Theater, Rhino Theater Rhinoceros. It was, a, oh. a, uh, it was a play called Up Jumped Springtime. And it was in 1998 at the Theater Rhinoceros. And it started in the basement, in that 50-seat theater in the basement. Because as anyone, any artist on this call will know, 
hopefully. When someone says they have space and it's available for free, you take it. And you figure you figure <laughs> out what you're gonna do. You just take it. You're like, Doug Hostclaw, they offered me the basement in the summer. Do you want to do you want to uh, tell a story in some way? I said, absolutely. And there's Jamie and Lujan, my friend Jamie just joined. Um, <laughs> uh, we, we go way back, me and Jamie. Um, and so and so I really I took him up on it and I started um, adapting a book of anthologies from brother to brother, uh, Essex Hemphill, about yeah. growing up black and gay in America. And I created a, a three uh, a three person um, show. We all played all these roles, uh, Damon Van and Brian Sharber Yates. And um, we did it, you know, with uh, $500 of my own money. Again, I feel like I've always taken bets on myself and like, let me invest and figure this out. And mm -hmm. I, I think back then I still have a lot of energy and I'm able to um, have people come along the journey and say, well, this is something for us. We're writing this and creating this thing for us, this thing that wasn't there. And uh, that became a successful show in the basement. And then Theater Rhino decided to put it on stage, uh, part of their 20th anniversary season. And then I was able to enlist my friend Danny Shea to direct it. And then um, that was the first piece where I knew that I had something to say. And oh I had something God. to say as an artist, yeah. You said Danny Shea, and he was my professor at UC Santa Cruz. Of course he was, that Vundekin, <laughs> that wild, wild man, that wild but man. That's, that's, that's the aesthetic I kind of got reared in with, at Shakespeare Santa Cruz. Same here, uh, absolutely. Um, I want to maybe go back a little further to like how you got started in theater, you know, storytelling. Um, tell me a little bit about your family. I, I think right. you said your, your father's from Belize. Yes, my father's from Belize and his family, they came from Guatemala. So that's the Latinx part of me. And uh, my mother is a, a black woman from uh, Philadelphia. Her parents came from Georgia and Alabama. It's funny, I've been doing a whole ancestry thing just recently. And you know, yeah. anyone who knows, you get on ancestry.com and you, you end up on there for seven hours. I've been <laughs> tracing back, tracing back. Um, but basically, you know, I grew up in Philadelphia um, mm -hmm. and I'm a small family, small as you know, uh, I have three other siblings. Um, I'm the middle boy. And I'm not necessarily, I wasn't the most, um, I don't know, I think I come from a very loud, gregarious people, and I was the quieter one. And I was more of the observer and the, the nerd um, on the school newspaper and things like that. When I went to Temple University, I, I went as a journalism student, and I took, uh, my mother encouraged me to take an acting class because she knew there was something that I liked when I did it in a summer program. She thought, it would be good to get you outside of yourself, you know, just like, you know, be expressive. And so I did that, I took an acting class, and, um, with this guy named Chris, who I just recently got in contact with again. He was the one person who told me, he said, um, he pulled me aside one day after class. He said, have you thought about pursuing acting as a career? And I thought, mm. no. I mean, I grew up in the inner city, Philadelphia. I, I, I didn't know anyone who was an actor. I didn't know that was a possibility from people that I knew. I thought mm -hmm. other people did that stuff. Other people went to, you know, even the universities. I thought other people went to Juilliard, Yale. I didn't go there. So, um, I thought, no, I never thought of pursuing this as a career. He said, I think, I would hope that you would explore this because I think you have a gift. Mm. And it was the first person, again, again, I think our teachers, which is, I think maybe, which is why I've been encouraged and that's why I teach from time to time, because I know the power of a teacher. By just that word, he, just that phrase, it was the first time anyone told me I had a gift. Mm -hmm. And I took it seriously. And then I started doing some training offsite at the Walnut Street Theater School. And I was you know, doing all the things like laying on the floor and filling myself up with orange juice and breathing and all that stuff. And I never felt happier in my life. And um, I, I was very private about it. I didn't tell anyone that I was pursuing this acting, what they call thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, but I, I, I was learning about it and respecting it as a, a craft and a profession. And, and then I moved, um, like I said, I moved um, to San Francisco and San Francisco was the place to truly, um, I tell young artists all the time to go to a place like San Francisco or to Chicago where there are true craftsmen there and people are doing it to do the work. They're not doing it to make sure they get a, a television show or, or you know, looking at it as, you know, oh, this is a stepping stone. They're looking at it, no, this is actually what it is. This is what we devote our lives to. Mm -hmm. And I think it, the Bay Area reared me as an artist and said that I create, I have a voice at the table. I I create, um, I was always showing up to, because my, my, 
I've, I had a little experience coming into this profession, but I had a lot of heart. Mm -hmm. So one of my first jobs, I went to auditions and just, you know, I was winging it and I was learning and reading about things. You know, I was reading Uta Hock and I was reading Stanislavski and then I was applying it. So I was in my own, um, I was in my own conservatory. I would go to rehearsals and I wouldn't know what blocking was, but I would watch other people. I, I didn't know what people were writing when they're writing SR in an arrow or DS. And I was like, what is that? And so, but I was quiet, but I would go home and keep learning. And I would show up to rehearsals I wasn't called for. I still do that because I think you can always learn from everyone. I don't ever want to feel like in my career that I've got it, that I've figured it all out. I think that's mm -hmm. when you think it's over, to be very honest. I feel like you may feel the same way. I feel like I'm always afraid that I'm going to fuck it all up, that it's all going to fall apart. Because I think that that's what helps me take risks. You know what I mean? I think the moment I get too comfortable, like, I said, I started my career in the Bay Area, then I moved to New York after things were very successful. I was working mm -hmm. at all the Bay Area theaters, Bay, Berkeley Rep, ACT, you name it, and doing great work. And I could have been there for the rest of my career, but I, then I got hungry. Um, mm -hmm. And then I moved to New York and I wanted to put myself in that situation again. And I was in New York for 14 years. Um, successful career there. And then I spent some time in London. And then um, I decided to move to LA when I, and I did not move here for career. I moved here for life, just for in terms of like saying, I just wanted some outdoors and quiet and peace. Mm -hmm. You know, as you, you know, as we, you know, turn 50 years old, happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but, but, you, but you know what I mean? I think that we, you know, I think I just wanted a different way of life in a, in a space for me to just create now as well. I'm no longer in that hustle, but I'm in that hustle of creativity, you know? That's beautiful. That's really beautiful. I, 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 when did you start to take bets on yourself as a writer? Because this, this, this series has been about writing and inspiration and, and what is it that, that compels us to write? What was it that, uh, in, in, I imagine that this was all happening concurrently with your acting career, that, that, that the play started to come out. Was there someone or was it yourself that, you know, I really need to tell this story about my yes. family or- And I'll tell you this, the moment I- the gardener work on there okay yeah what i honestly you know what i started writing because i saw a deficit i saw a true deficit in stories being told about people of color in an inner city i would be constantly frustrated when i was going to auditions as an actor and i would i remember this one audition for nash bridges all my bay area people will know these auditions um, Barbie Stein called me in and I was sitting there and I was waiting to go in for a character named Cool Whip Tyrell. Now, I have lived in the inner city all my, you know, most of my life and I'd never run into a Cool Whip Tyrell. Like, Who's writing this material? Why are they limiting our experience to some narrow, narrow vision? And it, it felt like, um, it felt like a conspiracy to, to me, to be honest. I'm like, this, these aren't real people. These are people that I know. It's like, the, it's like people are pushing an agenda with who we are. So I said, you know, I mean, my mom even said, she said, well, don't, don't be frustrated about it. Do something about it. So mm -hmm. I did, I started writing. And I always tell any student I've ever worked with or anyone who's creating that no one can tell you not to create, truly. No one can tell you not to create. And I create always as if it will never be produced. That's the only way it can be as honest as it can be. I'm not thinking about, I'm actually not thinking about audiences. I'm not thinking about um, oh, I should keep it to only four people so it can get produced. I'm not thinking of anything like that. I create the thing to be the thing. And so I knew that, and I don't know what, honestly, I don't know where that comes from. I don't know if it comes from there's some sort of confidence, but I think it's trust and faith that you, you have something to say and this is the way to say it. And so I started to create these characters that I, wa I wanted to see on stage. Uh, there's a character based on my sister Avery, who I always want to see on stage, who's complex and interesting and loud mouth and cusses and tougher than any dude. But she's also um, she's also the first person in my, in my knowing my sister. She has ran into a burning house to save elderly people. She mm -hmm. they don't know they only know the loud speaking yeah yeah that talking girl or whatever, or they don't know of the complexities of our families. I'm like you know. Uh, the idea of a blended family of like my father from Belize and his family and my, and my, my African-American mother and the honestly, you know, and like what that looks like. So I, I wanted to create these stories that I think that, you know, we have so many stories 
And I think to have faith in that and to trust that they will have audiences and they just as well, like just like O'Neill, just like August Wilson, just like, yeah, you know what I mean? And I think, like I was telling you earlier before we got on the call, like Octavio Solis is one of my heroes. I think Octavio is one of the most brilliant writers I've ever seen. Um, and I, I just love the way we can tell stories of these, what these ordinary people with extraordinary um, circumstances, you know what I mean? So I think that's what I've always been interested in. And that's what I, I keep even challenging myself to write about, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I think um, I only take work, only do work. It's funny, I think I had a conversation with Lynn Nottage about this. She said, um, she said that she doesn't believe she's the most uh, well-disciplined writer. And then, uh, and I talked to Lisa Crone, who said, oh, she, she has writing hours, she writes every day, she does this. And I think I'm somewhere in between where I'm like, I sort of, I will have a question in my mind possibly for a year. And then at some point, and I have an idea where it's going, and I'll just think about it a lot. I'll write some notes down here and there. And then at some point, I know it's time to write the play or it's time to write the musical or the screenplay. Because I think I know, I know where I'm going. I don't know exactly how to get there. But I know the questions, you know, what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean. And then yeah. the characters will will come out. They're going to reveal themselves. Uh, I have one play that I know I'm ready to write now because I've outlined it all in my head. Now I know exactly what it is. Uh, I just don't know exactly the. I don't like to know the endings of things. Uh, you know, so I'm like, I'm not sure how it ends. <laughs> yeah, there's a prevailing theory that. Uh, well, you know, there's some writers who say you know your ending, but you know, I I just love to dive in when like when I get an idea, I just get. I just start binging like I just write and I you know I wrote a play in 10 days a couple of summers yeah. ago and it was just like I was on a plane I was at my parents house I was like it, wherever you know I could sit down and write I had my laptop and I just started writing yeah I, I want to be able to um uh open uh have other people talk because I I'm, I'm sure they're all dying to ask you questions but I sure. I want to uh ask you because this is called the Latinx uh, Super Friends Playwriting Hour. Um, to what degree has Latinidad shaped your creativity? Does it, uh, sometimes it, you know, I don't always think about being Latino, but you know, sometimes it manifests itself in different ways, whether it's who we're working with or what show we're working on, or what character you're playing. But um, talk, can you, can you talk a little bit about Latinidad in your life, in your work, and, and absolutely. where do you think it's taking you now? You know, absolutely. Again, I began my career in the Bay Area where my comrades were people like Sean San Jose, or, um, and, and uh, I would just always be inspired by my fellow like, Latino artists, like, like Monica Sanchez, who I told, told you about earlier. And I feel like it's really, I think that it's funny, growing up in Philadelphia, I was always, as, as a man of, of both heritages, I think that we have always been, um, you almost have to choose when you look like this in a way. And I think growing up, the, um, honestly, uh, growing up, and my, my father is a Spanish speaking man. I remember when my dad would come around, my mother and father were separated, but when he would come around and every so often trying to teach me Spanish, I sort of like didn't want to be different. I didn't want, I don't know what he's saying, and I would ignore it. To be honest, I, mean, I don't know what he's saying at all. And I think that that sort of challenge, in, it was like trying to figure out your identity. You're like, no, I want to be just like, I grew up in only just, you know, black neighborhood. And so, and then I always have, we'll have the questions, well, why is your last name Domingo? Where does that come from? And there was a whole side of my family, to be, to be very honest, I felt like, you know, because my mom and dad were divorced and I had to do the work to actually get to know that side of myself as well, uh, culturally, um, in, in every single way. So I'm, I'm very close to my aunt who lives out here, my aunt Safarina who lives out here. And I think that she has been, you know, hey, we need to take a trip to Belize, we need to go to Guatemala, we need to go to Central America, we need to, she's always trying to end, you know, there's a whole Belizean community here in LA and, uh, and uh, you know, they, they really go in, in LA. So I think that part of it, it's always shaped, I think now even more so as an adult, it's shaping all the work that I believe, the way that I think we can continue to elevate and tell our stories and make them, I always write more than anything, to be honest. I know that I'm always interested in, even beyond um, Latin, Latinx, I also think that in, in Black folks, I center my work around women. Mm -hmm. Because I think, generally, I feel like I've been around strong Latin women, strong Black women. Mm -hmm. um, the women that I could always recall, I want, like, I want to tell their stories. I want to tell stories, you know, um, 
and, 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 and have these incredible women that I know, like Lisa Ramirez play. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I feel like, because I always say, I'm like, oh, they can play me. Queens and they can play kings and they can play, you know, such dynamic human beings because they have such a wealth of spirit and experience in them. From you know, uh, you love Lisa Ramirez, Daniel. I do too. Uh, I just saw a comment, <laughs> you, you know what I mean, or Wilma Bonet, or yeah, you know, you know, yeah, Lisa, Viola Davis, you know. Lisa's always here, she's not here today. Um, uh, but but I know Sean, Sean San Jose is here somewhere, but he oh, is he? Yeah, oh, good, maybe they'll make an appearance. Mm -hmm. Um uh, okay, I do want to open it up, but I, I just had a thought about about the moment that we're in, COVID, Black Lives Matter, um, anti-racism work, which is now like um, finally part of like the lexicon for many of us to start engaging with in terms of like, how can we, I feel like this is the evolution of theater and the evolution of our industry and entertainment. I, do you have any thoughts about how, uh, where, where you see it going? Are you hopeful? Are you? <laughs> I am tremendously hopeful, to be honest. I'm on every, it seems, I'm, on, I'm on at least like three committees, uh, whether it's with Hollywood or Broadway and, and theaters, where I think that, you know, asking for systemic change, really holding, because I think that, you know, it has to work on all fronts. It has to work on the corporate level and the institutional level and, and politics, but we're all doing the work. And I feel like that's why it's like, I, I love that it's so systemic. It's like, oh no, we got to hit, hit, hit at every corner. You know, and when, when you see something, say something. So we like, I'm having conversations with AMC executives at AMC. I'm having conversations with the League of Broadway Theaters. I'm having conversations wherever I can. And how do we uh, move the dial? And, and actually really, I actually don't like the idea, for me personally, I never like the idea of demands. I like the idea of like, here's, this is something that we can do together. And this is gonna benefit you, it's gonna make you better. You say, you say Black Lives Matter, I'm gonna hold you accountable to that. I'm gonna hold, this is what you can do. You can establish, you know, a, a department of diversity, equality and inclusion. A full department, not one, not one person, not a specialist to come in here because we know that's temporary. But when you decide on a corporate level, when you decide on an institutional level that there is an executive and someone who has a seat at the table, then actually they, they can actually make some real change. That's what. So I'm asking theaters to do that as well. Whether it's whether it's the taper, the geffen, the, the public, you name it. I said, yeah. Every time I go into the, these doors, I don't see black people. I don't see. I barely see. I barely see Latin people or Asian people. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. That's got to be important to you. That it, and it, from the executive level, uh, level, the board level, and even when it comes to the board, like I'm on the board of the Vineyard Theater, and they know for sure, like the way I'm on the board, especially as an artist, my ask, because usually, you know, board members, you pay some money, you give some money as well, I will bring some money in, but I'm the artist, and I feel like they should do, continue that with people of color as well. That, that should, it should be a mandate that no board should be, you know, 98% white. Right. And that, re that reflects everything. It, re it reflects programming. It reflects, uh, you know, audiences. It reflects grants. It, it reflects everything. So you want to be better, really be better, and really make it an institutional change. So right. that's that's me and my big mouth. So that's what I'm doing. No, right now. It, it, like, reflect the society that we live in now. It's 2020, right? Yeah, but and, and really do it and hold them accountable. And I love the idea that people are saying, oh, we won't work at your theater. We, we can do something else. We won't work at your institution to be a part of it. You've got, I feel like, but also we've got to be ballsy to do that. And we've got to all do it. That's the thing, again, I think we're asking, especially in our country, we're asking the reason why even this COVID is such an issue is like, we're not all doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's just crazy. Why, why are you walking out of here without a mask? Why is, it, why is that political? That's stupid. That's what that is. Yes, I said it, and <laughs> it's just plain stupid. And right. and then it's just like, so if, so it's like we got to be doing the same thing. So if we're marching together, we're really marching together. You know, we really want to make change. Really make the change. If you say Black Lives Matter, prove it. Right. Yeah, people are walking around without a mask because poor leadership. <laughs> um, yes. I'm gonna. <laughs> uh, I want to open it up to folks. Um, if you uh, so. If you have a question, Thea, they can either write it in the Zoom group chat. Yeah, you can post or they can, can hit that uh, raise No hand. questions from Sean San Jose. I'm totally kidding. He's, <laughs> Sean, Sean's, Sean's teasing me right now while we're on. <laughs> um, okay, you can hit that participants button. There's a raise hand button down there. Um, if you'll hit the little dot, 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 you can, uh, if it doesn't show up, it should be right in there. Yeah. Otherwise, go ahead and toss them in the chat. Um, 
And if, you know, if someone asks a question, it gives you an idea, feel free to unmute yourself and join the conversation that way. Uh, yeah. If you don't have your, your video on, uh, um, just, please just join us. a quick us. question, Coleman. What is the name of your production company and does it have a particular focus or vision? Yeah, it's called Edith Productions. And we're truly focused on um, all mediums, whether it's television, film, animation, uh, theater, absolutely. Um, so, you, you know, I think usually they're, I think lately I've been really interested in smaller stories, um, especially in the television space. I think that I just started watching a show called I May Destroy You on HBO. Boy, that's one of those shows where you're like, ah, oh, I wish I was a part of that in some way. I love these small, interesting, character-driven stories about yeah. people um, that are truly flawed protagonists um, in extraordinary circumstances. You know, whether it's, you know, she's really just dealing with, you know, um, consent. And I think, you know, I think I have a series that I'm sort of, I'm working on right now that's about um, toxic masculinity. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like these smaller, smaller themes echo in a large way. So I'm interested in things like that. So you name it, I'm interested in. You can, you can go to Edith, edithproductions.com and I can lead you there to send some, send some stuff. You never know where great stories come from. Thank you, Coleman. That's really, really great. And I was bummed to see that Candyman got delayed because I really love that. Yeah, that's but it's not too far away though. September 25th. Oh, okay. So uh, I thought it was it was pushed back, right? Was it going to come yeah, out? Yeah, pushed back from June to September. Yeah. Okay. So I'm looking forward to it because I, I love what you're going to do with it. It's going to be great. Oh, All right. uh, you do. Okay. <laughs> Anybody has questions for Coleman? I, oh, I do see a raised hand. Uh, Andres, you are unmuted. Hi, Coleman. Uh, thank you for, thank you guys for doing this and a uh, pleasure obviously meeting you. Uh, my name is Andres, I'm from New York and being black, um, Dominican um, and also uh, black, obviously, I struggle with in my storytelling with identifying what, um, what choices I should make in my writing. Um, I grew up in Harlem, even though I was born in Washington, in the, the Dominican Republic. And so I identify with being obviously a black American and in my culture is very Latin, very Caribbean, very, very South Samaritan, very Dominican. Um, so can you, I guess my question is, can you talk about how you, um, how you deal with having a lot of options? And um, cause I, I don't have the, the um, I cannot write option. I have the I have too many choices and I don't know what to write about option as I'm working on a on a one person show right now. Hmm. Too many options? You have too many options, you say? Too many ideas. Too many ideas. You gotta boil it down to just the question. What is the burning question? And I think it will come to you. I think the as we know, writing is rewriting, it's it's boiling things down. But I think let's see if you let's say I had a question about how does one grieve. And I wrote this mm. comedy of manners called Wild with Happy. And I had this character who in my mind was, he was sort of like a, a, a New York theater critic. He was bitter and, and, and <laughs> he was bitter and raw and just, and he didn't have an imagination. And the whole play was pushing him to believe in something again. Because I had a question on like, well, why did my grieving period with my parents happen in a very um, I leaned into it. And, uh, and then I had questions that people said, oh, I ran from it. I went into drugs, I went to sex, I went, I went far away from it. And then you see that it crashes down on them years later. When it's, there's some, the relationships suffer, work, all that stuff. And so I had questions, so that was my burning question. And I stayed with that question as it pushed me through and the characters developed a character named Aunt Glow kept coming in. She had something to say based on what this character, I like to deal with characters that have strong beliefs. If I have four characters in there and they have very, very strong beliefs, Marty Noxon, who's, um, who wrote Buffy the Vampire Slayer, says something on a panel once and I, it stuck with me. She said, a great protagonist is very much um, hell bent on holding on to an idea of themselves and it's up for the universe to try to change it. You know what I mean? So uh, the idea, I always love putting like four people in a room who have very strong ideals. And then there, that's where you get your drama. You get your drama right there. And your, your drama will continue. And it will continue though, they're gonna argue and wrestle and fight all the way through until hopefully there's a crack in a new way of, possibly a new way of being. I don't like to wrap things up. That's um, Oscar used to say to me when I was, when I 
in some of my first plays, he said, I used to tie things up in a bow. And he said, you have to leave it a little, leave those bows open. Like there's an opening for something new, but you don't step through it fully. But you know, the play continues on and you hope because that's human. That's actually who we are. So I think you just clarify what your ideas are. You know what I mean? I think it, and, and just be honest with your story and telling that story specifically and let your imagination go wild with it as well. I think I wouldn't want to limit you. I think the idea, when I first wrote Wild with Happy, I had, this guy was grieving. I thought he wasn't, he was seeing, uh, there was a double version of himself that came in. There was, um, when his aunt was in a car and she was spaced out, she would replace herself with a blow up doll. So that was a lot of ideas. I had a lot of ideas in there. Your first drafts will always have a lot of ideas. And then at some point you start to boil them down. What's, what really helps tell the story? What do you absolutely need? And then you have to, you know, have to learn to sometimes to, you know, kill one of your babies and, and just let it just say for the greater cause of this, I want to make sure. But right now, what I tell you, any actor, have all those ideas, but just have those specific questions and what you're wrestling with, you know? And then it, as you rewrite, as you rewrite, you realize what you don't need anymore. You're like, oh, that's fatty. I don't need that. You may not cut full scenes. You know what I mean? But start with that burning question. Write that question up. Keep writing it up. Write it right above your desk and just say, that's the question. That, and, and the whole experience is trying to answer that question. Every scene tries to answer that in some way and it's building upon itself, you know? I think, and I think I, I've learned to write in a very, um, I, I've learned to write as a craftsman. I, did, I didn't go to school for writing, but I learned by telling story and really keeping those questions in the air. Cause that, that's, what, that's why we want to keep going on this journey with them and making sure that journey is that's everyone, that's the whole audience, that's everyone's experience, it's human and specific, be as specific as possible, you know, with your experience too. So don't, don't think that because you have all these things going on that that's a, a negative, it's actually a great thing. Lean into that, but know that it will, it will boil itself down to the essence of what that through line is, what, what is the journey of your, your main characters. Thank you so much, that was super helpful. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm so glad. Good luck to you in your writing too, my friend. Thank you. Who else we got? Monica Sanchez is here. Oh. <laughs> First of all, Monica Sanchez, I saw you on Octavio Solis is, uh, when he did that and I thought, Monica, I've been seeing you in so long and you look so beautiful. So I'm just saying hi to you right now. <laughs> oh man, mi corazón. Mi amor, mi amor. <laughs> How are you, my love? Good. Uh, God, it's great to see you and um, I'm late to the Zoom, but I've been following the conversation the whole time, FYI. So here's my question. Um, as when you're writing something, what kind of feedback is valuable for you? And I'm asking now that, uh, now that I'm doing um, quite a bit of teaching and I'm reading students' works and I'm, I'm really kind of enmeshed in this pedagogical challenge of the revision. Um, so I'm interested in asking many of my playwright friends, like what, what do you value? What kind of feedback is valuable for you? Thank you, Monica. You know what I value personally? I, I'll tell you this. I have a, um, a producer that I work with and I sort of had to sort of have a conversation with her because if, I, if I'm detailing a rewrite and she reads it quickly and just wants to give an immediate response, I can't, I can't handle it because it's not well thought out. I feel like it's an emotional response or whatever. I'm like, okay. Like if you say, oh, I don't like that name. You don't realize how I researched that name and that name is connected to this and it's connected to this and it's connected to my grandmother. But you never know what the choices that we make. So I feel like I always say there are, time, there are times for general notes and there are times for prescriptive notes. And I think when I'm further along, it's better for prescriptive notes to go to the detail of like, well, I'm not sure if you need that, that sentence. I would take that out because that, I don't think, I think you wanna still like raise questions. I love anytime, like the Liz Lerman way of a uh, response um, that, you know, they use uh, with like, and I, I know New York Theater Workshop used that a lot. I love it when I'm, I'm being, um, I'm sitting after a reading or someone's reading my script and they ask me questions. So, so, um, so what did you, so what does the protagonist want? And you know, so um, and what, what what is the Achilles heel? And then I would have to answer, or just or just I don't have to answer. I could just take that note, because then I know that with that question, I might have not have answered that, or maybe I don't want to answer that. But I know it's great 
questions are a great way because questions are just positive as well too. And I feel like you want to keep keep a person going on a journey and making sure, I always try to make sure I do this when I'm sort of watching someone's work as well. Well, I'll say, I will ask, well, I want to make sure it's clear the story. I want to help you tell the story you want to tell, not the story. And that's something that I know that when I had Scotty Z. Burns, actually, he was a mentor of mine at uh, the Sundance Screenwriters Lab. He was the only person, to be honest, that I thought I didn't really enjoy his feedback because he was giving me feedback on the script that he would write, mm, mm -hmm. which is different than look at what I'm writing, look at what we're writing here, and how how can that get better? How can I how can I streamline that or what don't I need? But don't tell me what well, I would take it in from this way and tell the story. That's not useful. Could you just get on board with it? Just ask questions. So you have four pillars in this community and trying to tell this. Um, and try to make them collide and then help them do that. Not say, I think it needs to just have a, a, a single point of view and that's the way I can follow the story. But that's not what I'm trying to tell. I'm interested in four points of view colliding, like Crash, like the movie Crash. How can I do that? So I think you always wanna just keep asking questions. So are you very interested in the point of views of these characters and they wanna collide? Is that right? Wonderful. So then you know how to keep, I wanna help you tell that story and give you notes based on that. So, you know, so I, I think I always try to do that. And also give, and sometimes you know, we, we just have to read the room and just know what they can handle. Like if they can handle a couple notes right now, that's all they can handle. You know, <laughs> you, you, as you know, as a teacher, you, you, and you know, as an actor too, you know how many notes you can handle. I and mean, you, you, you know, you're like, I can handle, I can take in this note. And if I just bring up these two, these two notes, that may be all they need. It can actually, they can probably, they'll probably even do like a, a page one rewrite based on that, <laughs> you know, with two good questions, you know? Yeah. And then I think there's a time, once it's in a place after it's rewrites, rewrites, and you know it's a place to be prescriptive, then you can go even more detailed. But I wait for that. I, I love to wait, wait on that, where I feel like now they can handle it. They've done the big picture, you know? Yeah. Hope that's, that's helpful, Monica. That also, that also reminds me even you know, because I don't have formal training as an actor either. And I know that, yeah. from, you know, developing my own, my own methodology that one of my most beloved relationships with the director would be when I could say, um, this is what I want to do. And then they can tell me very much, oh, then, then I can give you these kind of notes or we, then we can build this together. That's the same thing. That's the same thing, Monica. That's the same process is transferring that process to the, to the writing, you know, which is, and I think that's the same thing because also I know that you are, um, Monica, you guys, Monica and I have been friends for a long time. I've known her, we've known each other in the Bay Area since we were starting out. And, and whoo, exactly, well, we still look like babies, right? <laughs> but I think, I think honestly, I think it, it is that same feel because I think we came from that same culture where, um, where we're being asked to be in the center of what we're doing. No one's manipulating us to do something else. They trust, and I think that we trust as well, the artist is is smart, and you intel you have some some intelligence around this. Let me help you do what you want to do. So I think you just keep applying that because I think that's honestly I feel like I know the people they can always hear it when I'm auditing someone's work. They know it's coming from a place of love and appreciate and knowing that you can do it and you can get there. Like to trust that and I think it's the same thing that we trust. We trust that directors know that we'll get there. Yeah, I'm not there on day one or day five or day seven, but I'll get there. But you, you know, you know. So I think they, they just need to 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 know that more than anything. And I think I always impress upon that I that I'll, I will always give them something good that they've done. You know, even if it's like let, let's say even if the draft is like, oh, I don't even know what this is or what I'm looking at. I will focus on something that they can pull from there. You know, yeah. Thank you. Good see, good seeing you, friend. All right, we had Javier, I believe. Do you still have a question? Yes. Hi. Um, thank you, Claude, Cantea, and Coleman. This is a really cool moment um, and oh. a very interesting moment in this crazy, crazy time right now. Um, but I'm Javier, and my question was, so one thing that's really inspiring about you and like, I think commands a lot of respect is the amount of hats you're wearing as like a writer and a director um, and an actor. And I'm really curious just to hear about like existing as someone that's wearing all three hats at the same time. For example, like 
you know, being in the room in the Walking Dead room as an actor and then suddenly directing it, you know, <laughs> like how, you know, how was that process or like, you know, working on Scottsboro Boys as an actor, but then I'm curious, you know, if you're still talking, you know, to John Kander on the side, like, hey, you know, but I also write, you know, maybe you give me some tips, you, you know, these are my hypothetical situations in my head. I get you. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> you know, thanks. That's a great question, Javier. You know, I think that, I think honestly, it comes again from the way I was sort of groomed as an artist. I was in rooms where I always felt like that even though I was, I was an actor or a writer or director in a room, everyone, that we were all in the same space of just trying to create the work. So there's no ego, we, we let that go. So whenever I'm in any room, I, I think I, like, let's say if I go into a room and I know I'm an actor on this, you know, the kind of actor I am is that I'm gonna have questions about some text and that's just what I do. I may have questions when I whisper to, you know, a director to say, hey, how about if we do that? Like, I will help staging, you know, because I know I'm like, oh, so what are we trying to do here? Oh, great. Like, I will ask a question like, oh, so what are we trying to do here? Great. So you're staging this. Oh, how are you shooting this? I will ask questions because, and that's also for, in my way, helping my director as well. And I want the same thing when I'm on the directing side for my actors as well, that we're all doing this work together, that there's no, oh, I, I'm, I, I've never believed in, oh, I'm silent as an actor. I just... You direct me and I sit and I go in my little silo. No, I have an opinion about everything. I'm sitting there and looking at scenes that I'm not even in because I think it's fascinating and I'm interested. And I think being a collaborator is truly being a collaborator, you know? So I think, I think we have to, you know, figure out what our responsibility is as collaborators, to be honest. And how it's like, it's important for all of us to get in and respectfully to get in there and do the work. And so, and I know that by doing a bit of everything and on different platforms as well. Everything helps another thing, to be very honest. I think I've always been, you know, you ask my friend Monica Sanchez or Sean San Jose, who's on this call, I've always had a, a mouth and with questions. And, and uh, so I was, I was already like becoming a dramaturg, whether I knew it, when I was already becoming a director, I had a point of view about that. And so it just made sense that, so when I'm in the director's chair, I understand my actors and what actors need and how to have a conversation with them, how to get what I need out of them as well and make them feel elevated. So I know that. So I know that being an, being an actor has also made me a stronger director and, um, and I think, uh, and vice versa and writer, you name it. It all, it all becomes one to me. And so, and also I love just going back and forth between um, genres. I feel like that's something that always makes me feel, um, I don't know, it makes me feel like, a, I'm doing it for the first time again. And I think there's nothing like that feeling where you feel like I'm about to try something I haven't tried before. Um, one of my collaborators, Sean San Jose, you know, he's consulting me on a musical right now. And I feel like we're kids, like we just started out again. I feel like we're trying to figure something out. And I think that's where you actually find, that's the only way you can become innovative. And it, 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 speaking of like people like John Kander, or let's say Alpha Fugard who I've worked with, they have that spirit. They, 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 all these, these people who have been masters of what they do. John Kander sent me um, uh, a lullaby. I asked him to write, to write for a benefit. And he was so nervous sending it to me. And he said, oh, I, I hope you like it, I'm not sure. And I was like, what? I hope to always be like that, to always feel like I'm not really sure. I hope it's good. Because I think the moment I think that we feel like we've got this, I think it's over. I think the journey's over. I, I, I think you would, you agree. Yeah, I think you all agree that like you want to feel that people may call it hungry or a hustle or something. I call it just a curiosity and that, I, that I've, I've seen these masters have and they're very open. I mean, yes, when I was working with Scottsboro Boys, I did go over to John Kander. Tommy Thompson, who wrote the book, would hand me the pen and say, when I say, well, I'm not sure if that joke works. He says, what do you think? But I think I've established that trust with him. He handed me the pen and said, well, I would write that and I would write that and I would say, and you give it up to it. You know, I don't need a writer credit for that. It's what I, I'm supposed to be used. As long as we feel that I'm doing everything I can as an artist to be used. And it feels very spiritual, honestly. It does feel like a, a calling. It does feel like a mission, but it feels like you want to be in service. And if you think I'm just being in service, that's when you know you can do your best work on any platform. Thank you so much. Thank you. You, Thank you're you. welcome, my friend. Thank you. Beautiful. Next up, we have Chris Lindsay. Yeah. Hi. Uh, 
good afternoon. Um, good afternoon. How's your How's your day going? It's going well so far. How about you? Good, good, good. Uh, my name is Christopher Lindsay. I am a third year MFA student at Brown University, getting my degree in acting and directing right now. Um, and I also do some playwriting as well. Um, I think my question to you is, um, as a young artist, um, I find sometimes it's hard to keep that, that level of self-confidence uh, in the industry that is uh, at a pivotal point of changing, but for a long time has only um, honored one, um, one avenue of beauty or what, you know, hasn't really uh, looked at you know, my, my, my skin or your skin is beautiful. Um, and so from your experience, how do you keep that level of confidence um, as an artist and as a, as a person to, to bring your full self into the room and not feel like, you know, your aggression has to be toned back because it might intimidate people or um, what you say might not be valid. Um, that's, a, that's a great question, my friend. And I think I, think I know how to answer it. And I'll start with the story. I went to uh, Savannah College of Art and Design and I worked with some students for a couple of days. And um, I asked them to present a monologue with the way they think that, you know, show me what, what represents you. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, this, one, this, this big girl, this big curvy girl got up and um, she did a monologue from Fat Pig from Neil of You. And it was different than what I thought she would do because I, I got to meet the students sort of in a round table and we were just talking and laughing. And she got up and did Fat Pig from Neil of Butte. And I said, oh, so why did you choose that monologue? And she says, well, I, this is what um, I think the way the, the, what the world will see me as or cast me as. And I said, well, what do you see yourself as? Because when I was talking to you, you seem like a queen to me. You seem like you play Juliet, not the nurse. So, and, and then we had to take a moment because she actually broke down in tears. And, and so we dealt with that. And I, I wanted to actually, and then I brought it home where I thought, you've got to tell the world who you are first. And that's, it starts with you. And that's the way you're perceived. We can't let the outer for it. The, the world is already telling us as people of color who we are. And we have to tell them, actually, this is who I am. Whether we write about it, the way we present ourselves, and you come full voiced and full bodied. I've never, all of this has always been all of this without any apologies. And honestly, I feel like it's been received as such. I think the moment we start believing that our voice doesn't matter or our looks are, are not uh, in vogue or something like that, I think that that's where um, we give away our power. I've always tried to inspire my fellow artists to create. And the reason why, to be honest, is because I know it gives me power. I know what helps me put on my, put the S on my chest. You know, you know, you know what I mean? I know what armor I need to go out there and do the work that I need to do. And to trust that the work is divine. And it comes from a place where I know I'm in service and I know this is my destiny. That's part one. Part two of your question is something I've been talking to my students at a great call um, with some of my students at Juilliard when they were, they were saying they were getting out of school and they felt like they didn't know what they were stepping into. I think it's okay. Yes, this is, it does feel like it's, um, we don't know what is gonna happen after all of this, what the industry is. And I tell you, this is what I wanna inspire you to do. I wanna inspire you to continue to take an interest in things that have nothing to do with this art form. I wanna inspire you, I want you to have a knowledge in science and art and architecture. I want you to be in love, to fall in love, to fall out of love. I want you to think about traveling, going somewhere, gardening all this other stuff that you're gonna need that once we find our way back in, in this industry, you'll be ready as a full human being, more than anything, full. Cause you need a, a full human being and full experience to reflect the times. You need to be politically engaged. You need to be conscious of different things. You need all of that. The work doesn't stop. So just because there's not auditions on the horizon and things like that, we don't know what, what's gonna happen when everybody's back in studios and the PPE and the procedures and all that, that don't stop nothing. You keep working on you because you need all of you. You keep reading, you keep having an interest, you keep finding new things you didn't know about yourself. You sew, you, whatever it is, you never know what, what this moment is supposed to take you into. Don't think it's stopping you at all. Let it be a breakthrough for you into something new. 
a new you. You know what I mean? Yes. Be, 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 be adamant about that. Let, let it be because you're because you are the next generation and it does fall on your hands. Don't let it feel like it's stymieing you right now. Let it move you forward and propel you into something brand new. You have no idea what you're supposed to be because of this or do. It could be something even greater than what, a greater impact than you thought you were gonna do as an actor, truly. You know what I mean? You, you know, I, I know a lot of people go to school, whenever I go to universities and I, I teach a couple of days and mentor, I, I honestly feel like I'm not there to teach you to become an actor. I'm not there to teach you to become a writer or a director. That is not my interest. My, my interest is to give you some, some tools to live in the world. If some of those tools apply to your, your acting work, if, if I walked out of Savannah College of Art and Design and that young woman now has a voice and a different perspective of who she is in the world, I've done my job. Because I know she now has a voice in the world and she has a truer um, spirit of herself that she's able, whether she applies that as an artist, if she applies that as, a, as, an, as an actress, an activist, I don't know what it does, but I hope I changed her. I hope I shifted her whole paradigm on being a big girl in the world and letting that be her power. So that's what I, I suggest to you, my friend. I appreciate that. Reminds me of the monologue from Jesse Strange. Here, Mr. Franklin. Oh yeah. Oh, dear Mr. Yeah. Franklin. Exactly. Yeah. Do it all, man. Do it all. I Do it, it all. <laughs> all right. Yes, I wish sir. you well. All right, brother. Thank you. Same to you. You're very welcome. Well, that just turned my entire day around. Oh, uh, next up, we have Somia. Hi. Um, I apologize that my camera is not on. I literally had a migraine until 15 minutes prior to this event. So I look like a hot mess. So that's why I'm just talking. Um, thank you so much for this. Like you basically answered like one of my three, like two of my three questions I had for you. Um, you serve, my <laughs> <laughs> um, the third one, I think is sort of going back to something that was said a little bit earlier about what Oscar used to said um, regarding you tying your plays up into a neat bow and then trying to mess it up. I guess the process for me that I'm having right now is there's one play that I kind of tied up in a very neat bow and I'm kind of going back to it now after a year mm -hmm. of not writing anything. Yeah. Um, and I'm just sort of curious as to how you went about messing it up for yourself. You know like, what I did? You get to that I point? get it. I get it. That's a great question. I think because I realized I was just sort of like, once a, once a character has a, um, this is what, it's funny, I, I, I always ask these questions and in the television space because my TV writers, for some reason, to be very honest, a lot of them write a little ham-fisted and make sure that characters are very conscious of what they're saying and what they're doing. And I thought, and I'm always fighting against them. Like, well, that's, then that's the end of the journey. If I know, if I'm, if I'm so psychologically aware of why I'm doing it, then the journey's over. And that's what I was doing in my plays, that people had, oh, I understand why I'm doing this. Then the, that's the end of the journey. So I think that you need to, I needed to sort of like snip those bows and let it still be like people are still on the journey. If I set up a scene where th this was, okay, I was, uh, excuse me if I feel like, I feel like I'm, I'm, cause I'm so old and I feel like I'm name dropping, but I'm not, I'm just telling you because I was, I was, a, I was a writer on this, um, I'll say it, I was a writer on the Motown musical for a moment. And then I, I recused myself from it because I wasn't interested in the storytelling because mm -hmm. I would challenge Barry Gordy and, his, and the rest of our team because Barry was very much interested in preserving the legacy of Motown, which I think was wonderful. But we needed a character that had some flaws and had, um, he asked me one day, who's the protagonist, who's the antagonist? And I said, you, you're both. I don't think he particularly liked that. And I, cause I thought, well, that's very, I said, well, because he was interested in, he, he had an idea, he created this thing and it became successful. Well, where's the drama? Where's the actually, the, yeah, I mean, where's the complexity with, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. so for me, it was like, he wanted it all tied in a nice neat, nice, neat bow. And I thought that's actually not honest and it's not human and it's not, it's not interesting. And um, so whether people have seen that musical or not, that's my opinion of it. But, um, but I thought that that didn't make sense to me because I think that you actually, there's, that's not really human. So I think you, I think I like the idea of, lead, I like messy people. I think people are messy and they do messy things. Are they consciously doing messy things? No, they're not. Um, <laughs> you know, some people are like, you know, some other, some people that we know in power, but, uh, <laughs> but I think that, I think that I like dealing with people. I, I sort of like pile on complexities to characters 
So therefore they're no easy. You can't tie them up in a bow. They've got a, they want to take a step at the end of the play or at the end of the season or end of the pilot. They want to take a step into changing or growing. But do I, I don't think people just, you know, no one truly changes. There's elements, they're still, still gonna do messed up things. But I think that's ultimately so human. And yeah. we wanna see that because I think that's where we see ourselves in it. So that's why I feel like leave it a little messy. I think if you think of them like, yeah, you can't, they're not gonna, the next morning that the sun will rise and all that, but they've got work to do. Mm -hmm. I always like to leave it any experience feeling like, well, you got, you got some work to do now. Uh, and then you move on. I, I wrote a, I co-wrote a musical that I thought was tied up in a bow and I still have questions about it. I didn't, I didn't like that it got tied up in a bow because I don't think it's honest, but it, it wrapped itself up for a lovely commercial run and uh, had a beginning, middle and end. And it was great. You know, I think to be honest, sometimes it probably pandered to uh, people who feel like they need a, to finish it and feel good about themselves and go get their car off the garage and they don't have to think about it. But the things that really move me are things that make people think. I have this mm -hmm. musical called Lights Out in that King Cole, which is a raw, angry, you know, fiery, filled with sugar and dynamite piece of work mm -hmm. that, that, that leaves, that's a little messy and leaves a little messy at the end and holds everyone a little accountable. And I think um, that's what I enjoy. Awesome, Hope thank you going. so much. That was very helpful. And you're just inspiring me to like, now I wanna go write things. So thank you Do for it. that. <laughs> Good, that's the point of today, go write things. Get it out of your system. Thank you. I sure. haven't seen the Nat King Cole musical, but but it's interesting you talk about it because Nat King Cole, as as we've been presented, um, to as he's been presented to the world is so. He's the epitome of grace. Yeah, he's he's. And I wanted to dispel that. Yeah, <laughs> because I, I thought. I don't know, because I, I wrote that because I had questions about, I had, I was curious about Nat King Cole as a character. And I thought, there's no way no one can be that graceful when the KKK is lighting crosses on your lawn and being dragged off stages and things like that. And so I found an article in 1958 in Ebony Magazine where he, I could see that inner rage of, of, yeah. of an artist, of a man in conflict, of an African-American man in this industry. And I want to write towards that and make it a sort of a dark night of the soul where he's challenged by his friend, Sammy Davis Jr to to let out some of those dark notes that that's okay you don't always have to float over the top but that rage you can tap into and that's okay so there's a challenge and i think that's possibly even like i know it was reflecting myself as an artist thank mm. you so much Don daniel um so i think that that's what i was um i think those are the things that i know that to be very honest lights up not king cole for me is like the one piece of theater if i never know, wrote another piece of theater again that would say what I wanted to say and what I believe theater can do. And I think wow. it's, it, and what, what I think the power of theater can do and how it can be that arresting. And, but yeah, again, I come from the show, the musicals that I've been a part of were like Scott's Boys or Passing Strange are things that they're not for kid gloves. They're, they're there to challenge audiences in every single way. And I feel like that, yes, it's challenging you with thought and ideology. What do you believe? I want audiences to be looking to each side of them. Like, did you, are you laughing at that? Why are you laughing? You know what I mean? I want it to be a communal experience. And I think, you know, again, that's part of my roots in the Bay Area, where I feel like that's what that's what we do. Mm -hmm. If you don't do that, you didn't do your job. That's right. I yeah. think we have time for just one more question before we have to let you go. I know you have a busy schedule. Sounds yeah, wonderful. That's right. Um, Iraisa, you are next up. Hi. Um, thank you so much for everything you've said in this hour. I feel like I've learned a lot and have been inspired. Um, Thank you. And I, my question was uh, specifically to development and the difference when you're developing a play that a solo piece that you are going to perform and a piece that you're writing for others to perform. And if you have a, if there is a difference in your development process, um, depending on if you are the one performing it or if you are bringing in others to do that. I think, I, let's see, I wonder if I can explain it this way. When I was writing A Boy and a Soul, I realized at some point, I forget who gave me this note. Someone gave me a note that the character, the central character of that was sort of based on the younger version of myself was severely underwritten. I, everybody else had the, the better things to do. It was much more interesting and more complex. And but the person in the center didn't have a lot to do. 
I also did that with a, a play, um, another play that I was in called Wild with Happy. But my character was the straight man. Everyone else was running circles around me and because I felt that was much more interesting. And I don't know what it, if it's a, an ego thing where I feel like, well, I don't want to make it about me. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I realized I wasn't doing my, my character any favors either. <laughs> you know what I mean? He was a severely undeveloped uh, character. And so you have to, with solo work, you really have to, something that you're going to perform, I think set yourself up for some challenges, I think. And, and also in the way that you tell that story and to, you know, I, I start to research um, other solo artists and for whatever, you know, just to see how solos operated. And then I want to also, like with anything, like as, as an actor, you do your research, research, and then throw it away. Cause you want to tell the story the way you think this story can be told. I remember Lisa Crone, um, incredible writer, asked me after she, uh, told me after she saw A Boy and a Soul, she says, you know what, there's nothing about that show that should work. And I was like, wait, what? And she says, structurally, it shouldn't work, but it works. How did you do that? I followed what I believe the way the story had to be told. You know, at some point I'm playing five characters at once and, and it's just, there's no costume changes. It's just a shift of my body and a gesture. You know, but I felt like, oh, I've created these scenes and doing things like that. And it just made sense with this character's journey, experiencing it through me, how he should see this and how he should become. And I didn't, and I felt like I didn't want it to be, I come from, again, I come from, I started in basement theaters in the Bay Area where I was creating things like you do as a kid in the backyard. Oh, oh now this is a hat, you know, but I'm like, <laughs> you know, but I think it made sense to me with that was just like, no, I don't want it to be too slick. It should, I think the idea of a solo performer, and I argue this a lot with, when I see solos now and it has a lot of video projection and stuff like that, I said, you diminish yourself. There's more power in you as a performer and what you can do. Show me, be the storyteller, take me there. You be the center of the event, you know? And I also think that there's another, if you're ever interested in writing a solo, I think one of the strongest words that I use is we, not I or me, mm -hmm. because I've never been attracted to the work where it's like, oh, this is a story about this person's journey. And no, this is a story about, I'm gonna reveal part of myself to tell our story. This is also your story. I'm enlisting you in this as you know, you're, you're, you're complicit in, in, in this experience. So that's for a solo. When it comes to anything else I've written, like, like a play, I do think that, you know, I wanna write the characters that, I always have a character in a way that is sort of, has a lot of skills that I could do in it because I feel like I wanna create roles for other black men in that way. And um, I like, and people always say, oh, well, you're gonna play that role. I'm like, no, not, not at all. I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not playing that. I just wanna, it should be there though. You know, everything, yeah, everything, I'm not writing everything about, it's not about me. <laughs> you know, I think it's very selfish. I'm like, no, I'm writing it because I want it to exist in the world. So I think you just be, just be honest to all your characters experience. And the thing that, the thing that I will leave you with that I know that I know for sure is when we're truly honest about the way a person speaks, the way they move, the way they question things in the world, don't censor any of it. Let it be as honest and as raw as possible. That will get to the truth of the matter. Um, I think that's where I try to operate from in all my writing for it to have, to truly be authentic and not think, oh, I need to temper this down or I can't say that. Or, you know, I was writing, I'm writing a treatment for something for, that would be on like premium, like premium cable, but now I'm, hopefully it'll go on like, you know, NBC or ABC or something. And one of my producers was like, well, do you, did you want to um, take out some of the curse words and stuff like that? I'm like, no, no, we'll figure that out. We'll, we'll get there. But right now, that's the way they speak. I don't have to tell you. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, I'm like, I, I, can't, I'm like, I said, let, let's see. But right now I want to be honest with their experience. If that's you know, even if it could be like alarming or something like that, I'm like, that's, what, that's the way they speak. I'm not judging them. You know, I just know that for sure in my writing, I've always started with sort of an archetype or some trope. And then it was my job to smash that trope to make you think, ah, you thought this character was this way. You know, especially people of color on this, on this call, you know, I will start with a trope that makes you think, I will go back to my sister. She's loud, she's crashed, yeah, yeah, whatever. She's, she's all these things. And then I'm gonna go much deeper. This is what, so audience members, I know who my audience is. You came in believing that this was this woman and that's all she is. And it's my job to show you it's that and all these other colors. 
and, and then by the end of the play or the show experience, you'll realize she's just like you. Yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome, thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Coleman, it's the top of the hour. Um, I don't wanna take any more of your time. So I just wanted to say thank you. I'm so grateful that you could bless us with your wisdom and your inspiration and um, I feel like I see you everywhere on TV, which is mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> remarkable, but it just shows how many people really respect and love your work. And, 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 and that, I, I think, you know, this business is small. I think that there aren't that many individuals who, who people want to work with. And I just see you working all the time, which just speaks to, I think, who you are as a professional and as a human being. So... Thank you. Thank you. And also want to echo that belief on these as well. I think, and I think that is why, I know why, because I come into a room because I want to make the room a better room. And I think that we can extend, especially now, extend even more kindness, more grace, um, helping out our fellows in one way or the other. It's a, it is the only way we're going to get through this and in, into the future. We just have to really take care of each other. And it's, not, and it's just not, not lip service. It's truly taking care of each other and holding doors open for people. But also, you know, especially when you see people trying to bang those doors open, I think it's, it's important for us. That when you have agency, make sure you're bringing somebody with you, you know? And all, and all the people, and I always tell people, my students this, show up with something to give. Networking, I think is a terrible, terrible word. I think it's an ugly word. I think you, it's generosity. It's like, what can I give you? How can I be a part of your dream? What can, what can I do to be a part of that? Without anything attached to it, truly. Mm -hmm. And trust me, I have a 30 year career. I've seen it come back to me again and again. That's exactly how it works. Yeah. Thank you so much, Coleman. And yeah. everybody, if you cannot unmute yourselves and say farewell to Coleman. Bye. Oh, yes, yeah. sweetheart. Thank you. 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 Happy, Thank you so uh, happy everything. Happy pride. Happy birthday. And happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. It's such Happy a great birthday. day. I get to share it with the world. So. <laughs> so great. Thank you for having me along. Be blessed. Be well, you guys. Well, man, hope to see you again in person soon. You too. Be well. Be blessed, you guys. Bye. Okay, bye, everyone. See you on Monday for the last Super Friends. <laughs> Thank you, guys.